Uh, I hope after tonight it won't be another 12 years. Um, I only live around the corner. It's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the themes in the book rather than the book. I'm not here to sell a book. In fact, we don't sell the book. We produced it for ourselves. There's so much vanity publishing in architecture, we thought we'd take it to a new level where you can't actually buy it and we make it for ourselves rather than getting a publisher's imprint, which I think you're doing yourself, actually, in your editions Maclean or whatever. Um, so what we talk today is about the kind of attitude that we have developed over a long period of practice. We have been practicing since 1989, which is 27 or 8 years ago, just to put it in context. Um, I'm in partnership with three other individuals. We studied at a place called uh, the Bartlett for our diploma. And it wasn't the Bartlett of today, it was the Bartlett of then. And um, we set up our own project um, as students. Um, because we rejected the project they were offering. And ours was not much more interesting than theirs, but it was, it was at least ours. And it is, so we've been working together for actually since 1986, which is 30 years, um, which is kind of unusual. We, we have lots of fallouts, which is probably why we survived. I've got this image up. This isn't our work. Uh, this is John Soane as illustrated by Gandhi, and it's traditional in, in kind of any kind of lecture to talk about your work, and I will talk about the work a little bit, but more in illustration in support of the ideas that underpin the work. We've grown from a small office of four of us, advertising in the Hampstead and Highgate Express um, for doing loft conversions to a team of 350 people. So it's been a journey um, and I've sort of, I always say, you know, all kinds of practices. We've been all kinds of sizes. We've always been involved with teaching. Um, we teach, you know, as a practice in different formats, different individuals doing different things. Um, we've always been interested in the, you know, the ideas that underpin architecture and how, when you're making architecture in the built forms, I think you can make architecture in any form. You can make it in paper, you can make it in words. But there is something about the craft of architecture. I'm saying all this because this is a technology lecture. Um, there's something about the craft of architecture that's quite important. A lot of artists will say that you know, life drawing is, is a kind of essential skill they go back to, even if it has nothing to do with their work. And if you took uh, the technology of making buildings out of architecture and called it uh, creative thinking about organisational systems, which is kind of the, you know, the what deep mind and... De Demis Hassabir doing with their artificial intelligence. If you took that away, it wouldn't be the thing it is. And the thing about it is, is you don't have to make buildings to be an architect. Um, architecture can be made on paper as it can in, in the built form. But there's something about an interest in making that's important. Very well illustrated by John Soane, because he was claimed um, you know, hundreds of years after his death, at least 150 years after his death, by, the, by modernists, as the sort of proto-modernists. I think if you look back to history, you might find... Soane was a proto-modernist because a lot of his clients couldn't afford the details he wanted. And that kind of tells you something about architecture and, and your engagement with other people in making. And if you're, you know, a, you know, if you're drawing architecture and you're not building it, you have a certain freedom, which kind of seems like a magical thing. But freedom also brings kind of incredible challenges. Um, and actually, in a sense, I find that the bigger the constraints, the greater the problem, the better off we are as designers to respond to something. And being told you can do anything you like is probably, for most of us, the worst possible kind of uh, constraint on creativity. Oh, how do I move this forward? Uh, ideas. This is uh, Guy Debord's The Naked City. I've not read The Naked City. I've not read his hypothesis. I've always liked the image, and I like the idea that what we say and what we do are quite independent things. And you know, you will present your work and there'll be a crit and they will have a completely different opinion of what you're doing and why. And no one's right or wrong, their opinion or your opinion, you know, um, are, are independent observations on the work you have done. And I think the act of drawing as well as making is kind of the fundamentally different and special other thing about architecture. I also think uh, the benefits of there's a big fascination now with the city and how half the country, you know, half the world, more than half the world, lives in urban agglomerations. 
which is quite interesting because that means that almost half the world doesn't. And it kind of makes that point about when you're looking at any problem, okay, so the current fascination is the city, um, but what about you know, the other almost half of the world who don't live in the city? Um, 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 how do you make architecture for them and what's architecture about? I like this image because we also live in an era, we work for some tech companies from the west coast of America and there's a kind of current view that we are in this most amazing era of freedom and information and flow and ideas and global communication and all these kinds of things. What we find is interesting with those tech companies is they're obsessed with getting people into rooms and not using the technology they've created. I also think there is a danger when Elon Musk or you know, Mark Zuckerberg tells you they're going to solve the world's problems with a few billion pounds. The World you know, Foundation's put a lot more money into healthcare than Elon Musk ever has or ever will. And there is a danger that there's a kind of uh, technological fetish going on where we're all imagining we're kind of so much more advanced than we used to be. Of course, not everything. If you put the naked city into uh, Google, you don't get um, Guy Debord. It's not in there. No one's managed to put that one in. I know that because I was trying to read up on the subject like everyone else in a soundbite fashion. And this illustration, the great Louis Kahn looking at Philadelphia, and he's obsessed with traffic movements. Now, I spend a lot of time in America. We have an office there. Traffic, I like cars, and I'm very happy to go and drive in trips around America. But there is no doubt in my, in my mind that traffic has destroyed the structure of most American cities, which are kind of rather depressing, strange places to be, where if you walk, you're either a vagrant, you're stopped by the police, or you're you know, an Englishman in Oklahoma. And I think you know, it's quite interesting that Khan you know, saw the, the cars in a poetic way as reinventing a new kind of city. I think he was fundamentally wrong. He was a great man, but he was fundamentally wrong. And it was this kind of the fascination we have with the now and the future and the danger of uh, orthodoxy. So at the moment, we're worried about global warming and um, we're not worried about uh, privacy. So when I was a child, everyone was marching against having an identity card or any information on any of you in any shape or form in any way. Now all of you are identified on the internet in some way or another in multiple forms, some of which you can never remove, that you may regret. I certainly would regret my youth being on the internet. Um, so I think that's an interesting kind of challenge to, to, to technology and our perception of it. And going back to global warming, you know, you know, we just, Hinkley B has been released, or Hinkley A or C or whatever it is, a power station, a nuclear power station, clean energy to solve our problems. If you have clean energy, we don't need to insulate buildings, we can go back to single glazing, like this building once was, it'd be quite interesting for architecture if you did that, because you wouldn't worry about energy, and they didn't worry about energy in the 60s. But actually, it's quite interesting that we, people used to march against nuclear power, the legacy we're leaving for the next generation, for the next 10,000 years. So I'm not to say there's a kind of view, but whatever the view is, I think if you're reflecting on what you're doing as an, as an architect, and whatever you end up, wherever you end up doing it, your greatest skill is to kind of reference back through history and ask questions. That, in a way, is what architecture and architectural technology is about, asking questions. And the kind of asking the, you know, the, the bleeding obvious isn't a bad way of starting, because sometimes we get lost in the kind of mythology of, of our own kind of grand ideas. Um, so this idea of constraint, this is the kind of... Uh, if, if you look at London, the city where we build probably 70% of our projects, it is, I think, the most complex city in the world. Wherever else we go to build, is relatively easy by comparison. London's relatively open, but unbelievably complex. So if we put a major planning application in for a building, there will be 20 to 30 professional firms involved in that, and there will be a myriad, a layer of regulations that you can make up to sort of, you know, 50 slides on all the technologies, archaeologies, below ground, above ground, visible, invisible, uh, legal caveats, and that's, you know, before you even get into a planning submission, we might consult 50 different groups. That's kind of big challenge, but in a way, on one sense, we're being trampled on by regulations. In another sense, it's actually quite good because you have to think hard. You have to be smart to get through them. So in a sense, you could say it kind of self-defines the success 
of uh, good architects. Cynically, you could say, they're the people who kind of get their way around the rules. But on another level, good design is about kind of taking all that complexity and making it simple and legible and successful. And successful for a future we don't yet know about. There's a big debate in London at the moment about the skyline. Um, you know, we're ruining London. This is a kind of one of two or three hundred Italian hill towns. It's that kind of, think of the kind of Wren's image. My daughter's doing this Fire of London project at school. It's all about the churches and the rebuilding of London. The pragmatism of the merchants who came out and repinned the streets the day after the fire. We didn't build Wren's grand plan and we just rebuilt the old city. We didn't rebuild the old city. They wrote a new set of uh, building regulations about party walls and the directions of Joyce, the detailing of windows, the proportion of buildings, the proportion of streets. So along the old lines, they built a completely new city. And of course, that city was, it, and is still, an ad hoc collision of different estates and, and different organisations. And indeed, it's more than one city. It's at least three cities. Um, but I quite like this image because when we worry about London skyline, and I've got an image of that later, this city is one of 200 Italian hill towns until you realise it's actually San Gimignano, which through its towers, the vulgar expressions of uh, power and identity, it's become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But if UNESCO was involved now, they certainly wouldn't let this happen to San Gimignano. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a necessarily saying all constraints are good, but just kind of an interesting observation on where we have to pitch ourselves in our view on the world in terms of thinking about uh, the, the, the sacred and the protected. And we are in a strange era. I was talking to someone yesterday about a cathedral they're working on. It's, they're the first generation who cannot make new in that cathedral. They can only remake old. We've kind of reached this point in life. Yet in London, which is sort of 70 central London, 60 or 70 percent conservation areas, we do actually remake the city continuously, which is quite intriguing. So I've talked about London, London night and day. I, you know, there's a sort of an architect once said to me, the trouble, you know, architecture is all about the three Fs or architectural practices. And I asked what that was, and it was finish, photo, and fuck off. And it's kind of, it's a neat summary of the problem of architecture because. We make designs, we make drawings, we, if we're lucky enough, we want to, we make buildings. And then when we finish the building, it reaches what we call practical completion. No one has been in it, no one's used it, and um, we have nothing more to do with it thereafter. It, it takes for its own life, which is not a bad thing that it takes for its own life. If the building's any good, it should be able to take on its own life. And in fact, quite interestingly, looking around your building, it's better than it was 12 years ago partly because you've stripped it back to what the original architect thought about, which was a simple and clever and constructible system of uh, building components and spaces that could last long term for different people to use in ways they hadn't ma imagined with technologies like the internet and the computer. You know, we're not, you know, a computer then was probably larger than this building to kind of do what your phone does. Um, but this image is also about, you know, the life of the city if we take a building down, as we do on occasion, um, any enthusiast, and you ask them what was there, including people who knew and loved that street, it's, it's, I call it the kind of uh, baseball cap rule. No one looks above about six metres. Even we architects who love looking at buildings, if you take a building down, no one could quite remember what was there. And so really the life of the city is provided by people, history, pattern, that is all delivered into our buildings afterwards. So we build for someone else, someone who's building a building for a purpose, an investment or a programme, whether they're public or private sector, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it's for a use that we, that we can guess at, that will probably change. And if it's any good, the building will survive. And that's quite a kind of interesting tension because we're all into briefs. I'm sure you get briefs, you look at briefs and programmes and technologies, and yet, at the same time, you don't control the life of the building. You shouldn't control the life of the building. But how do you design buildings that can last into the future and be of value to, to future generations if um, you know, you're not aware of that and, and if your brief is too constraining? 
And we produced this diagram when we were students. Um, it was generic city. This was the cutting edge of technology. It was called the 2080 Xerox, a photocopier, which we could blow things up or down. And this is uh, Mondrian's uh, Broadway Boogie Woogie. And it was a kind of analysis of city grid and density and the idea of plots getting ever more dense as you move to the center and ever smaller. And it was kind of important to us at the time, technologically, in terms of the amazing graphics we were using. And as an idea about thinking about architecture in the city as one consideration. And we produced a book as students called The Fifth Man Experiment with Four Buildings. And that book, um, we haven't moved on very far, that book produced uh, in 1986 is the kind of precursor to the book that I sent uh, Will and Pete uh, a, few, a few weeks ago which was about the idea of the ordinary. And we came up with two statements that we recently kind of recycled in a lecture at the RIBA. First, it's in the field of everyday buildings rather than public buildings that modern architecture has failed the city. And second, that functional program alone is not sufficient to generate an architecture. Those two statements we wrote as students that led us to make our diploma project a speculative office, which obviously is not necessarily the most glamorous uh, subject, but we knew that at the time, we were quite intrigued by that. But it's that idea that Actually, modern architecture, I don't think, you know, it failed the city as every architecture has failed the city. I'm not, you know, blaming uh, modern architects. I come from a, a family of modern architects. Um, it's this idea that actually we tend to get interested, and I think it's even more so now, in the particular. So you will find in World Architecture News or all these other, Dazeen or whatever, they will tend to be talking about particular buildings with very particular programs, for very particular uses that are not the lifeblood of a city. Most cities, as Elder Rossi would say, are full of ordinary buildings doing an ordinary job, well or badly. And actually, to me, the, the simplicity of, of those buildings and the challenge of designing those buildings to make them successful is far more difficult than the extraordinarily difficult building of, say, an art gallery, you know, which is actually, we did the Saatchi Gallery, we've done quite a few galleries, Art galleries are relatively simple things for the modern world. They are more boring and more defined than a speculative office. They are lots of white plaster, uh, barasol ceilings, um, big walls, neat detailing, and large pieces of art that doesn't really matter what it is, it will look magnificent in that space. So there's nothing wrong with what they do, but it's actually less developed. And then the architectural story of an art gallery is a big space in which people wander around not looking at art. Um, so, functional program also, they were saying, isn't sufficient to generate an architecture. So, if, you've, if you're kind of saying that the special buildings um, you know, are, where, you know, are okay, but we failed in everyday buildings, and functional program alone is not sufficient to generate them, what the hell do you do? And that's what we probably spent the first 20 odd years and continue to speculate in the work we do. What we do is we make buildings to test those two uh, thoughts. It wasn't easy. I like this image because this is a pop-up city. We took lots of ideas about pop-ups. This city's been popping up since 1850. It's the Dingle Races in Kerry, where I spend my summer holidays. There is a single concrete, reinforced concrete race stand that sits empty in a field of cows. And then once a year, for three days, all of Kerry descends here and people race and gamble and drink. It's an instant pop-up city, 150 years old. It's also, architecture is a bit of a gamble. When we were struggling, when there was four of us, when we were doing loft extensions, one of my partners, who's still a, in charge of all the money, he um, is a very, very big gambler. So we used to survive, because we used to work somewhere else, we used to put gold cards into the wall, because we'd earned a salary till we were 27, draw out cash, and give it to him to take the bookies. Um, and he did pretty well for us, I have to say. It's not a business model I would recommend. But it is a kind of illustration of the kind of one of the great challenges of architecture is surviving to make architecture. We came up with this slogan, uh, you know, we make money to make architecture. We don't make architecture to make money. Not that you can't make money in architecture. We have made money and we are a big business and we turn over tens and tens of millions of pounds. But that, that actually your primary drive should always be about what you do as an architect, how you pursue the things that interest you, how you tie in your interests to the kind of broader interests, and then you see how you can do that well enough to make value rather than, say, money. So the first project we did along that line was the very ordinary building. There was two projects at the time, 
in Walsall. One was an art gallery, one was a bus station. We went for the bus station. Our friends, Cruiser St. John, went for the art gallery. The brief for the bus station was to build 18 bus shelters. We came up with the idea of building a 120 meter by 40 meter elliptical concrete roof, stiffened um, by skylights on a two kilometer radius. So it's, it's, it's a flat segment of a dome. And we replanned the bus system and we've created a new public square. So to me, in a sense, there's little more ordinary than a bus station, but why can't you make a bus station a public building of note and generosity that helps enrich the lives of everyday people passing through it? In a similar vein for a client um, in West London, uh, we, we made, he, he was a fashion uh, company owner, he owns Monsoon Accessorise. We'd, we'd worked on a listed building, 1969 listed building, very beautiful building by the Westway, and then he asked us to make him a new building, and we'd, at that time we were working on another project with an atria. We only put atriums in to get light, they're not power features. But we came up with the idea of if we were to spend no money, we had to reduce architecture to its most simple component. The most simple component of this was a stiff structure because there is no core, because the core has been bolted on the south to take out the heat gain. And could we make a stiff structure that meant we didn't need any shear walls and the structure would give us the architecture of the space. It would give us the memorable qualities we were looking for. It would bring light through it. And this is our kind of model of a building like this. Very, very simple engineering. This is in situ concrete, a reusable timber shutter that shrinks as you go up. And all we do is adjust the shutter. And then you get this three-dimensional lattice structure conceived by us, engineered by Adams Carver Taylor. This is another very, very ordinary uh, project. This is a school in South London called Burntwood. Um, it's about taking the estate of seven schools, keeping two of them by Leslie Martin, removing five of them by Leslie Martin and putting uh, seven new buildings in there. And we were working for a contractor, not a client, but the school had their own champion. And the idea here was to use the simplest component possible on the basis that if we could eradicate details, we had the slight chance of making architecture. So we used a precast system, four panels that we rotated to, to reflect room sizes. It is an endlessly flexible building, but if it's endlessly flexible, you can then develop an idea of architecture from the outside as a kind of pattern making and shade making, so it's not absolutely rigid, because flexibility and rigidity are not the same thing. Similarly, this, is a, this is a, actually happens to be a, a health centre in Kentish Town, but the idea about this project was to kind of bring a lot of different social functions together in a health centre and transform the idea of a health centre by creating a kind of art gallery as health centre and kind of public garden. Here, working with Richard Woods, the artist, we are making um, a low-cost housing scheme uh, commissioned by an office developer um, to uh, utilise office uh, building making techniques and cross-transfer those into housing and the big discussion was, you know, we'd built modular buildings on a large scale. Would you build a modular building? The conclusion though, was no, the simplest building you would make is a uh, roll-out precast concrete um, frame, and then you could make apartments within it, pod them, move them around, not to move air up and down motorways. You could make a building that not only would work for now, but and the three different tenures, it's public, uh, private, and intermediate, um, but actually that building could change over the time. Not to go down the Dutch tunnel form that everyone loved at the time, because it's a completely inflexible and dumb system. And actually, a kind of shed with no cross walls is a much smarter way of working. But also, art has a place in building, not to be integrated in our view, but for the artist to engage with a place or a space. And this was uh, Richard Woods, who's gone on to be a, you know, an artist of some note, pursuing his interest in... Uh, suburban Tudor Beethan uh, timber boarding um, as a kind of celebration of public space within housing. And there's a theme to us about everyday buildings being ordinary and extraordinary. There's no point just saying it's efficient housing, and that is the problem of now when they say we need 200,000 houses. 200,000 units is of no use to anyone. You are making 200,000 homes where people will live, and different people will live, and they will live in different ways over different periods of time and you need to be thinking about it in that way. So public 
private housing. To us, the only difference was that the social housing had better room standards um, and some stupid ideas about throwing away the carpet every time a tenant moved out, and the private housing had slightly uh, better kitchens. It's just housing uh, for people, and you need to make it um, as delightful for them. In every ordinary sense, walking up the staircase is a rather better experience than it might be. This is not a new idea. This is Mies, universal use. He left Germany where he was making kind of alto vase-like proposals for towers. And incidentally, he went to Chicago, and incidentally, he discovered uh, Chicago bridge structures, and that defined the next you know, brilliant phase of his career, where really, in a sense, the most important of, of the modern masters, because he defined a vernacular. A vernacular that may have been corrupted, but actually at its best, a very simple and powerful way of expressing the making of a building. Equally so, as we were discussing recently you know, in, a, in a client uh, meeting, there is no truth to materials. So Mies used to stand up and give a very, very detailed lecture about the logic of the Seagram building, which is a steel frame clad in concrete, clad in bronze. There's no truth in that building at all. But he gave this hour-long lecture about the technology of the building, truth to materials, and then he paused, drew on his cigar and said, but we did it like that because we liked the way it looked. And I think that's actually something incredibly useful to remember as an architect, because most people in this kind of world of public buildings, most people don't enter 98% of the buildings they see. So the only experience they have of the building is the building in the city as it is perceived as an object or a in its relationship with other objects, and can it give them some passing pleasure if they bother to look up? And if they don't look up, do the first six metres give them some pleasure? So I think that's a really kind of, we in the office, and I will criticise you know, people for this, including myself, we will get deeply drawn into the kind of technological brilliance of some solution, or the cleverness of how we're going to win more area, or make a better journey, or whatever it might be, but actually, that's a kind of private game between us, our clients, and the people who might pass through our buildings. The reality of a, of a good building, an extraordinary building, it's one that gives pleasure to those who, who never, who know nothing about it and never walk through it. And I show this building, this is a project we've been working on for 15 years. We're continuously working on it. This is the T building. I'm in Shoreditch. It became a kind of hipster uh, icon and a huge commercial success. And it came out of a financial mess. 2001, a client bought a building, paid too much, couldn't do anything with it. And then they just said, look, why don't you do something to kind of keep it going? We're going to mothball the building. We'll knock it down. We'll do something better in 10 years' time. And it reminded me of the First World War admirals who had a crisis meeting in 1917. They said, gentlemen, we have no money. We have to think. And actually, crisis, 2008 was a great crisis for creative thinking. You need problems. Charles Eames says, without problems, there's no design. And this was really about just saying, actually, can we make these warehouses work in the most economical way, doing as little as possible, not to win area. So the normal office model would be, let me get me 84% office to 16% of circulation on a typical floor. Here we just said the whole thing is designed on minimal cost. That way we generated a new set of rules for the office, which was wide and generous circulation, good light, easy, easy movement, low cost. And because it was low cost initially, it developed a new model for how you let the building. Um, so in fact, they weren't bothered about covenants and the wealth of the businesses. Because there was a queue of people waiting to come into the building, they would just kind of let them come in. If they went bust, they wouldn't chase them. Someone else would come in. And on one level, you could say, what's that got to do with architecture? Well, it's amazing how much money on all levels controls architecture. Cost is kind of driven by an idea of um, end building costs, which is actually an irrelevance. If a client is building and selling, it matters to them. But in terms of the long-term cost of a building, the real cost is its life cycle cost, or that kind of dreadful cradle to grave chat. But it's true, life cycle cost is really important. And if a client owns a building long-term, we're working for the girdlers, people who used to make belts in the 12th century. And I said to them, we like the idea of working with you because and they're very they're all lords and ladies and they wear ermine they drink claret we said we like the idea of working for you because you're long-term players and they said indeed they said we've owned the site since 1504 and if you're if you if you have that long-term attitude it's something you know we need to instill in our 
you know, instant pop-up era that actually smart buildings will allow for change but won't need to be pulled down. Uh, this is a project in America. It's about as simple a universal building as possible, a simple um, extruded Nissan hut. I share this project because I liked the client. He died. Um, he's a rather amazing guy. He was called the Reckless Billionaire. He was a natural oil and gas man. When we found this site, there was a smaller footprint of a cellar in the basement that he'd built an embarrassing to him vanity project. It stopped in 2008. He was building a uh, storage building for his private wine collection where he could invite his friends to look at the wine collection and have dinner. And I said, it was quite a big basement, big enough for 250 people to party in. And I said to him, uh, how many bottles? He goes, oh, it, it was a vanity project, very embarrassing. I said, well, how many bottles? He goes, look, it was 100,000 bottles. And these were serious bottles of wine. And I said to him, yeah, that does seem quite a vanity project. He goes, oh, indeed. He said, uh, no one needs more than 15,000. Um, <laughs> that's, if you're a reckless billionaire, that's the case. Um, this is, that goes back to that Wren, Wren idea of London and the power of St. Paul's, which I think is, is, is a very important thing on the skyline. But it's also an idea about um, how in the city it's really important now that all buildings have what we call a public function. This is a private office building, but people use it as a public building. And indeed now, because we've done this, another building we're doing has a public roof terrace within it because there is an idea of opening buildings up. In a, you know, maybe it mirrors the supposed freedom of the internet, but opening buildings up to public use actually improves their engagement with the city, and that's becoming increasingly important. And this is this idea of the specific and the generic, and it's something we still struggle with, that a lot of the buildings we, we work in, we find a building and we do things with it. It was built for some other purpose. Whoever built it, you know, didn't know what we were coming to do. And so the idea of what you're doing in a building is kind of quite constraining and, and actually, why can't we have multi-layered buildings where people are living and working and teaching and doing different kinds of things? Why can't buildings be used out of hours in different kinds of ways? School buildings are the least efficient buildings in the world. They're used for about 9% of the year in terms of time. All buildings should work harder. Maybe we need to build less buildings, but use them in a smarter way. Um, this, is a, this is a building, this is an office building. I show this because you know, I think working with other people and technologies and old and new. This is Jasper uh, Morrison. Uh, getting laser cut solid Carrera marble pieces to place in the reception which kind of becomes a gallery to commerce. This is a gallery to art, this is the Saatchi gallery. We, d you know, we worked with them for five years, they said we, you know, they're on the South Bank, we don't want to be in a listed building. After a five year search we found them a listed building. It was going to be turned into an office building and what was quite interesting is an office building becomes an art gallery, goes back to being an office building. In a sense, it was originally an orphanage um, and it was then used by the territorial army. It was a rather good building with a rather simple circulation system. And I rather liked the Saatchi Gallery, whatever you think of them, I rather liked the Saatchi Gallery because it had no grand circulation. The whole thing is art galleries, which are easy to do. Um, this is again this idea of actually um, addressing your brief. So this was a brief for a childcare centre in Camberwell and where we work with a series of artists, English and Dutch, local and international. Because one thing we knew about healthcare, having done one other building, is the NHS will, not necessarily through a vicious kind of desire, but they will make a biz building as miserable as they possibly can within a year of occupying it. And this was the idea that by bringing art throughout the building and turning it into an art piece, we kind of uh, liberated it from the institutional chaos of uh, the National Health Service. And actually, there was an idea of children, abused children, surveillance, connection, concerns, and then the idea was to open the building up as much as possible so it became, uh, once you were in it, not to the street, but once you were in it but for the children, although there was a lot going on, there was a lot of kind of serious kind of psychological work being done there, it, it was an open and transparent, uh, connected series of spaces. You didn't disappear into the kind of uh, consulting rooms. Uh, this, is, this is work in the 21st century. You kind of hang about, the roof opens, and you have a drink. And I, I share this because everyone talks about the freedoms we have. I actually think I'm certainly working longer and harder than I ever thought I would. If I, you know, emails coming 24-7, people, you know, you, you, you apologize. In the old days, you got a letter, you waited a week, you sent a reply. Now you apologize if you haven't replied within minutes. 
Um, and these are kinds of challenges on, to our modus operandi that are quite important. And people say, God, what a terrible idea. You used to go to a factory, you used to clock in and clock out, and they knew where you were. Now you don't clock in, but you're there earlier. You don't clock out and you stay there later. And when you have clocked out and gone home, you're still working. So it's like just a, a query about the supposed wonderful freedoms of our age. This returns to this idea of the city and the everyday and how you know, the ordinary life of the city, actually this is you know, 100 years ago, this is Central Park, but the ordinary life of the city is actually quite extraordinary when you bother to look at it. The life of the street is the most amazing place and it's the thing that all new businesses are trying to mimic. This idea of chance encounter and engagement, they are all mimicking the kind of social patterns and life of the city. This is a building, um, this is a housing building, this is the building where Richard Woods made his art piece, and this is our idea about expressing the making of the building as a kind of three-dimensional uh, sculpture in the city. And then this is the same idea taken to the kind of mean streets of Oklahoma, a different kind of thing here, it's one, not, not in, in Adelaide Wharf there are no cars, here it's one car per room in Oklahoma, no one can move without driving. And I quite like this project because it's 224 flats and you drive to whatever floor you live on, get out of your six-wheel car and you walk to your 2,000 square foot rented apartment. Americans are bigger and their apartments are bigger. Um, you will all make decisions about what you do and why and who you do it for. Um, but I, I quite like this image of uh, Giuseppe Tarani's building, I think one of the kind of finest buildings of the 20th century. Um, built as the Casa del Fascio in Como. Um, Giuseppe Torelli was a huge fan of Mussolini and the black shirts. Um, he killed himself on the Russian front because he kind of decided he'd, he'd backed the wrong man, that Mussolini was actually a bit of a pig. Um, but after the war, the same building became the Casa uh, del Popolo. So Casa del Fascio, Casa del Popolo. The actual architecture of the building remained completely constant and if you look, think of the third man and that Orson Welles line about, you know, uh, think of, you know, the Renaissance, 30 years of the Medicis of violence and murder and the greatest outpouring of creativity in, you know, in a millennia. And then Switzerland, 500 years of civilization, you get the cuckoo clock. And in a sense, that kind of highlights not that you should work for anyone and do anything, but there is a sort of independent life of a building, regardless of who commissions it, if it's a good building, it's a good building. Um, this is a building, we, the only facade retention we've ever done is in Regent Street. There is a new building um, at, the, at the end here. And then these are retained facades. And then the front of Regent Street, I've never retained a facade, but I got the logic of Regent Street. One, it's a kind of a super conservation area, untouchable joy and, and, and delight for all. But two, it was always, always built as a facade. The buildings behind were bolted on by different developers like they were in Bath. They were only eight foot deep. So to me, actually, I decided it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do to keep this facade because it, it was a system to allow for the future to happen. In a way, more of a stage set Ron Heron system in a kind of much smarter way than we'd ever acknowledge. Um, this is Alison Wilding and in a way, this, she did a piece of art within the building. She's kind of, it's called Shimmy and it's about the kind of disappearance and reflection. What I like about the Alison Wilding piece is a kind of narrative for making architecture in London, certain parts of London today, because the main aim for most conversations is how can I make sure I don't see your architecture? Um, this is the architecture that reveals itself at the back as it's a technological um, lecture. This is a double glazed, uh, naturally ventilated, uh, Briam outstanding building, future proofed, although air conditioned, to allow itself to, to ventilate naturally when London gets cleaner, and it has an external skin to uh, protect the upper floors from wind, so it's triple skin. That also allows for maximum glazing because we frit the external skin um, to, to allow for shading, cleaning, and maintenance. But ultimately, we did it like that because actually we quite like the way it looked when you see it from Heaven Street. And the same thing here, this is the second iteration of that project, so there was two buildings designed at the same time, but this one is the second, built five years later. This is a pressurised, the first in the UK, interesting, the first sort of building visible in this part of Westminster that is a new building. Um, it's right in the heart of the Mayfair Conservation Area. But it is a 
uh, triple glazed skin, but London's got ever more valuable. The old triple glazed skin was on the back and was 700 mil wide. This is on the front, and it's only 180 mil wide because every square foot is worth 2,000 pounds. Um, and we pressurized the skin so that you get a small cup of air um, pumped into that void every hour to ensure you don't ever get dirt and entry into, into that skin. So it's a very smart, triple glazed, super efficient skin. Again, um, it was part of a planning story, part of an architecture story, and working with the uh, Turner Prize winning Keith Tyson with a map of London, an idea of, again, art as object in building, integrated but separate. Uh, this building in the distance is, I like, it's what was kind of first of a series of city sandwiches we were building at the time. This is 1,100 rooms, um, a school of 80,000 feet, a community centre, offices, all wrapped up into one building and a big discussion about the World Heritage Site view from Parliament Square. This is another city sandwich on Oxford Street, a very, very expensive, double glaze, double curved skin um, that changes its proportion for architectural reasons from a 4.5 to a 3 to a 1.5 bay as it moves up. Uh, but it's also interesting because we managed to persuade a client who sold this for a vast amount of money, which may seem irrelevant, but it's kind of interesting because this is retail and office and residential all stacked up and all using one core. So it meets my brief of the extraordinary. It puts together the kind of uses you would think that are normally denied by the people who fund buildings in a different kind of way that allows it to be built and allows this vessel to absorb different kinds of uses over time. And then here's another building in the city that I showed you earlier with the Jasper Morrison pieces. The idea of the building is a kind of a cut and sculpted form in the city, the driver in this building in the foreground of the Shard. So in the extraordinary building, we're always looking to make what we call city rooms. And the, you know, we, we drive a public, you, know, you don't open your house, you might open it an open house, you don't open your house to the public, it's a private place. Most buildings are private places. But where they become more successful on any scale is, is where they don't feel private. They feel that they've got a front door to the city. It's, you know, people talk about the new office of, you know, the West Coast or, you know, the future. Actually, this is the Uffizi, a very old office, but it was multi-use. It was kind of centre of power, uh, accommodation. The, you know, the court of the Medici's were there. Their soldiers lived there. Their workers lived there. They entertained there. Um, and it made it a public room but it then connected it, disconnected itself from the city with Vasari's kind of uh, corridor running, running away um, to the bridge. But this idea of actually private program creating public space. And I show this, a very old image, the Nolly plan, but it's an interesting idea in the modern city, where are the public spaces? I like to think it's not Starbucks. Not many people go to the churches. Um, so there's public space, but there's very little in between where you meet people in a kind of public forum, and that's a challenge for all buildings moving forward. I like this image because it's Edward Hopper, Nighthawks, and then this is an idea of a project we built in Liverpool, the Royal Court, where this idea of public rooms opening up buildings, allowing them to work longer. Most buildings to survive need to work in different and longer ways. A theatre is no longer a theatre. It's a public building where performances are put on at certain times of the day. Uh, this building is the post building. Um, it's again this idea of problems. We found six meter high, one acre floors. Not a problem to me, but a problem to the person who owned it and bought it for 110 million pounds. Um, it, it's a place that's been used for many things, kind of cool raves and um, designers block events and not so cool our 25th birthday party. But it's the most amazing space in London. And you've got these kind of fields. Um, and what we're doing is we're cutting that building, we're remaking that building and we're going to put a public roof garden on top of that building. And in a very, very strange kind of example of uh, private-public negotiation, we are providing social housing and an office building and a public roof garden, no private housing. And then this is the scale of the building. And this is one I always think about this idea of making a building in the city. It's a found frame. We are removing five floors and adding six, but we're keeping the first four, including the basement, which are all double height. And the found building kind of is allowing us to do something that, that a new building wouldn't allow us to do, which is great generosity. That is the scale of that facade. So these are immense pieces of architecture um, 
cladding a building. And I think that's kind of the tricky thing because all our buildings are made in Germany or Holland. It's kind of a strange thing about, I talk about the craft of making, yet we make them somewhere else in a factory to be technologically efficient. So it's about ready-mades and bespoke. It's about recognizing that buildings need to have particular characteristics. This is Jean Prouvé, but they can endlessly be adapted. This is the T building, a very different idea, but it's been adapted. This is the roof of the T building. It's being adapted for another kind of use. And this public promenade idea, like all ideas, is not a new idea. This is the Bradbury building in um, Los Angeles. I've been to the building. It's been in 32 films. I've never been in the space beyond the public promenade, but it doesn't matter what goes on that space. It's a memorable public room, like a memorable public square. We took that idea to this building in Amsterdam. It's a million square foot project um, that we've almost completed. And when we attended the interview after an international competition, we said at the interview to the client, um, doesn't matter what the brief is because it's going to change. You're a university. It's highly likely that none of you will be here by the time we've finished and that the programme you've given us will be completely irrelevant, which proved absolutely correct. It was quite a high um, uh, octane move, but it worked. And what we're saying was we're going to organise ways of moving around that building. So we cut out a large building here, the building used to sit on the, on the canal to allow the canal to go through. We created a bridge structure to hold up the building above. And then when we had uh, existing lift cores, we cut what we call mini atria, because we thought rather than people connecting along a 150 meter floor plate, they'd actually connect in clusters like houses around the building. So what we said to them was, we will provide space for the future, but a memorable sequence through the building. And this is Buckminster Fuller. It's the kind of his version of nuclear fuel. You kind of put a dome over Manhattan and you don't need to bother with uh, part L. Um, and we like that idea. Um, but making is part of it. This is our model shop where we make models, print models, and make one-to-ones. And then this is how this impacts on our buildings. And this is how it impacts it on Amsterdam. And here we're, we're color coding the uses. And the client was saying, well, why are you color coding use if use is irrelevant? We're saying, well, actually, it's just a nice architectural idea. And actually, you can repaint it anytime you like. It doesn't matter if departments change. That's the archaeology of use. This is the bridge. So the bridge, the memorable connecting place between the two cores, is a product of a structural solution to above. These are the mini atria. These are the basic shells into which life occurs. These are the, uh, what we would call the, the stage sets. These are the 20-year components. These are the auditoria that dock at the base of the building. There's eight of them, three and a half thousand students. Then this is the building in its intermediate condition. And it's kind of an interesting idea. You're always designing a building for the finish, but the, it never has a finish. And often, you never actually get to your finish. Um, luckily, in this project, this temporary cycle park has gone, and now there's a bridge over here. The temporary entrance has gone. But actually, when you're making it, you never know what's, what's permanent, what's the end, what's the beginning. And that generated a kind of way of thinking about the extraordinary to us, which is about theatre, stage, set, and props. The theatre lasts 100 years. If a building lasts 50 years, it lasts 100 years. If it lasts 100 years, as the Great Estates will show you, it lasts two or 300 years. It's a robust vessel for life. Um, the stage sets are the special spaces within the building that have some longevity of use. You know, that might be here, it might be an auditoria, or a restaurant, or a kind of media, you know, media room. And then the props, the seaside hut, are the pieces that are endlessly configurable. That's the furniture of your life. And we kind of put this one forward as a new kind of town and country planning act. As a, as a friend of mine said, I called David Rosen, an agent said, why the hell do we have use class orders? Isn't it just, don't you just do things in space that you want to do? But actually you don't. You'll be told, no, you can't do that. We have so much A3, B1, C1, C3, B1C. But actually they're just spaces into which things occur. So it's this idea of universal use, flexibility, long-term planning. And that generated to us the idea of the extraordinary. An architecture that you look at, that you realize is incredibly simple, but the more you look at it, this is Donald Judd's Spring Street, Street Studio, 1868. It's an endlessly repetitive system that has absorbed lots of different uses over time, that's also got a kind of architectural integrity and richness that celebrates structure, but also breaks a whole suite of rules. And that's sort of, uh, that's my son Gimignano of London. To a lot of people it's a problem, to me that's the life of a dynamic city. 
And I'm now going to talk briefly about how that idea has developed over time with one client. This is Derwent London. We met them 20 years ago. They came to our office. It was three pounds a foot. They bought our building. It's now 40 pounds a foot, but that's kind of life. They paid us to do it. Um, but we built this building for them, and we reused the building. We built a new building. We had this idea of a public room, um, a, a kind of public uh, connection between the different people who worked in that building and the cel celebration and exposure of the life of that building. And then we did a second building for them that ultimately became Burberry's headquarters, but it's the same idea. Take a building, reuse it, bring the kind of public space into the building. We did the same thing at the T building, and we brought in other architects to work on other bits, but it's kind of nothing's new, it's just recycling a building and actually allowing it to do different things over time. And in here, it's kind of classic, familiar stuff, but it really was done here because it was the cheapest way of doing it. Um, and then we made another building for them, and this comes back to kind of truth and honesty to materials. This is a concrete frame that we recycled when we added 150,000 foot of a steel frame, and then we expressed a new steel facade, but in aluminium on the front, because we thought it was the right thing to do. This is the interior, where through this making of the building and developing in the client a passion for the idea we have in the extraordinary building of stripping it back to the most simple things. Our view being all finishes deteriorate, so if you can eradicate finishes and get back to the raw structures um, of the materials, not materiality, a word I don't use or like, but the materials of architecture, then in fact, you might make a building that has some longevity and it has a new, numerous other advantages in terms of kind of uh, thermal capacity and this kind of thing. So this room is public and it's 12,000 feet. It's much bigger than any office building, but it's the, most, it's the thing that generates the success of the building and allows the client to invest ever more in architecture. This is the roof of the building. It does what it needs to do. It spans uh, the 15 meters, but it does it in a different kind of way. The beams are much deeper than they need to be. It's celebrating the idea of architecture and structure, making a room in the city. Uh, for the same client, we're now building a, the most complex project I've ever been on. This brings up an idea of time in architecture. This is number one Oxford Street, so that is uh, center point. That's that little bit of the tube that's popping out. And this is a great big mess that's blocked up this whole area for a very long period of time. We've started this project in 2000, um, when, when Crossrail was pre-Crossrail, when the client bought the, bought the site, and there was an idea that Crossrail might happen. We spent uh, five years working up a master plan to build housing at one end, offices, retail, and a theatre at another end. And this is the project of office, public space, and theatre. For a client whose original interest in the city was in making commercial office space, they now see, actually, it's about making pieces of city that are successful, and that's where they will generate the value, which is, at its best, a new idea for London about, you know, kind of mutual benefits of the ordinary becoming extraordinary and being able to be paid for by itself. So this is the complexity of the project. We are building above all of this, so our foundations are down here. Our building is designed to sit on this. We have four-story vent towers coming through the building. That's Tottenham Court Road. They're live, vibrating structures. We then build this theatre and office building over them. That's what we get. That's what we'll find next year. That's the building. This is the public promenade through the theatre and through the office to, to, to uh, you know, roof gardens and terraces. This is how the buildings come together. There's always an idea about the hero shot of the building, but buildings are only ever glimpsed, and these are the glimpses of the building. The church is revealed, the connection to Soho Square. This is a pausing place. The frame is a highly complicated kind of uh, Miesian expression of frame, but in fact, completely impure. Um, this is the idea of the auditorium, and we often have this joke about black box architecture. It needs to be memorable, it mustn't be a black box. Well, this is a black box, and the discussion with the theatre director is we have seven different configurations, but each one has to have personality. He doesn't want black box. This is the office building, the detail of the making of it, the expressing of the frame within. The interior, where we have no shear walls, so you've got no stiffness from crossrail. So we're making uh, the lift shafts exposed, and they give us the stiffness. And this expression of, of kind of steel and structure runs through the project, into the, uh, the view of the stairs, into the office plates, into the views as you look up through the city, to the to this kind of sky garden on the top. So the interest in making with this client is the benefit of building up a conversation over time. In 2008, when they had no money, so we had to think, 
He came up with the idea for two years of researching how would you build a smarter, better building. There are two ways to go. One is one we've been pursuing with Google, which is you know where everyone is and you supply air, water, gas, electricity, or wherever it is to wherever they are in the building. The other one that I'm kind of more sympathetic to, that's the sort of BMW supercar version. I'm more sympathetic to the kind of uh, de Chauveur version or the original Fiat 500 version, which is you make buildings in the most simple way that allow things to happen that don't need technology and you don't have a building control system. You have individuals reacting with the building very much as they have for millennia. And this was the kind of discussion with the clients for a series of projects. What we'd learned about raw space being flexible and converted over time, passive systems, efficiencies, robust construction, generous volume, the people we were interested in talking to, they're all dead. And um, the idea of, or here of the, of the most basic rules, very simple, a speculative office, 250,000 feet, that would be naturally ventilated, that would have big thermal mass, we'd pump some cold water through the slabs, would it be flexible, it stays cool, it stays warm. It's absolutely bog standard stuff, gathered technologically from different fields, put together, but it was such a shock to London that we had to do this two-year research project, we had to kind of prove its value, we had to talk about people we liked, how you might make a building. And then we had to build a whole mock-up in the air, 25 metres in the air. One, because we know the client, we know they like architecture, we knew that they'd want to change things. And two, people had to come and see it to realise that opening a window, this is how kind of weird life is, that opening a window was a sensible and acceptable thing to do because all office buildings, if they're going to be valuable, have to be sealed. And we called our cooling system concrete core cooling. To, you know, that was one of the big kind of project challenges because to sell space, you need to have an air conditioning brand name like VRV, AC, whatever you want to call it. You know, you, you have to have fan calls. You have to have a brand name. So we built this. We used it. We tested it. We worked with our apps. We developed with them an app so that the individual in the building knows basically very simply how much energy they're using it's a green and red light. Red light, open the window if you want, energy consumption will go, up, go down. Green light, open the window, energy, um, sorry, energy consumption will go up. Green light, open the window, and energy consumption will go down. So it's a naturally ventilated building. We then destroyed it. And then we've been working for the last five years in building six buildings around a new public space. So this client's been on a journey where they began telling us you couldn't enter office buildings that are private to the idea that actually, the mix of uses in the public space in the city is the primary generator of the value of the extraordinary, ordinary building. There's the building at Old Street Roundabout. These are the new and the old buildings we're bringing around it. This is the public square. This is the white collar factories that's being built. This is the reception, a flexible boiler house space you can steam set and play with. Kind of interesting technology that we make concrete um, shuttering using rubber that we put in steel to mimic boardmark concrete that used to be the cheapest way of doing things. Just like terrazzo, there's so many arts we've actually lost, things that used to be simple that we can no longer do. These are the upper floors of the building. And we have an idea in this is kind of ordinary, extraordinary building about convergence. Everything does more than you think it might. So the BMU system for the building is also the running track. The top of the plant is the club. These are the floors of the building. Interestingly, it's not finished, but they're all let and at uh, 20 to 30% more than the client anticipated. This is the building going up. And I kind of end with the kind of my, my kind of critique of the kind of fantasy of the modern world. Vitra had a slogan in their office, work is, is not, you know, it's not a place you go, it's a thing you do. Our view is actually work is a place you go. You go, you could all work at home. You come here to meet other people, um, to be engaged in conversations. And actually, the more we are trapped in a kind of virtual world, the more the physical world becomes important. This is how kind of tech companies like to think about it. This is Petra. It's the spaces in between that matter. And on a city scale, I always think Manhattan is a kind of great but dull city made interesting by its edges and by Broadway. London, they say, is an unplanned city. It's a planned city. There's just lots of them planned and chucked together. And it's incredibly successful to get its problems, which are many, because of the in interfaces, the strange collisions and the strange changes in density that make that city invigorating and different rather than the kind of monotonous, uh, repetitive nature of Manhattan. 
And I'll end here with, with a project we just finished for Google. And we're working with them in Berlin and building a big building in India. But this is their headquarters. It's a found building. We put some bridges because they want to make a promenade. It's a kind of doll's house. Um, they like the, all this stuff. I'm much more interested in this element, which is called Project Jack, which is really saying, for 50 years, we've been building walls and ripping them down. Let's make a new kit of parts out of a kind of CNC pre-ordered, simple uh, interlocking plywood panels that are manhandleable, that you can then drop different kinds of acoustic baffles in. You can make them open or closed. There's 160 of these in the building. And the idea that any team within the building can reconfigure these in a matter of a, a day. And they can choose them up. And you don't have to store the components. If you want to order a new one, you've got the kit. You just order it online. And that runs through the building. It's the most interesting part of the building to all of us. And this is the bit other. We took that into the fit out in terms of, actually, we call it jack ceiling, an idea of set of standard components you drop into the ceiling wherever you want. People obsessed with this kind of idea of the kind of Stanley Kubrick image of people um, escaping from each other, the idea that they're all playing table tennis and ping pong and eating um, and partying. But actually, that to us, it's the kind of jack idea that's much more interesting. Interesting, they still have technology stops, and that's their biggest kind of port of call. So in the end, the city, um, the ordinary, the extraordinary, the new world we live in, it's very, very you know, familiar. This is, peeps would recognize Hogarth's image of uh, the kind of creators of the day, um, eating, drinking, working, and playing um, in, in the coffee houses of London. So live, work, play, shop, eat, um, universal use, an endless tension in architecture between who you make buildings for, the fact someone pays you, but actually they're really made for someone who you don't yet know about. If they're any good, they have the generic qualities that make them kind of adaptable, but they also have specific qualities that make them memorable. If this building didn't have this double height and this promenade through it, it may not have survived. So I return to the idea of Spring Street, of Judd, and the importance ultimately of the idea that for all the joys and pleasures of the kind of thing that get us excited, technology, making, social space, promenade, actually, to most people, it's just what they see as they walk down the street. That is your architecture to them. Thank you very much.